Episode 89, Learning to be More Than an Athlete, with Laureen Hedrick. Welcome to Latter-day Life Coaches, the podcast where each episode is a conversation between me, Heather Rackham, and one of my amazing coach colleagues. Each coach here is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and certified through the Life Coach School. Together, we have one main goal, helping you live your best life no matter what. You ready for this conversation with the coach? Here we go. The pressure to be a good athlete starts early in a child's life and continues as they grow and settle into their preferred sport. With so much emphasis on winning and being good, it's no wonder that many young athletes can start to equate their worth and value to the success they are or aren't seeing on the court. After years of pushing and striving to be better and better herself, Coach Laureen Hedrick had a wake-up call that made her realize her worth and value was not tied to her success as an athlete. She now helps young high school and college-age athletes know that they are still great athletes, even when they make mistakes, and that their worth and value is not dependent on how well they perform. By helping these athletes let go of perfectionism, she is seeing them build more confidence, enjoy their sports more, and actually be more successful in all areas of their lives. Good morning, everybody. At least it's morning here where I am, and I am excited to have a conversation today with a coach that is actually working with one of my children right now. So this is kind of fun to have her here, but I have coach Lorene Hedrick with me today, and I am excited for you guys to meet her. Lorene, do you want to introduce yourself for us? Yeah, thanks for having me, Heather. So My name is Lorene, like you just said, and I'm a mental performance coach for teen and college athletes, um, both males and females. I actually initially started working with females, and this whole business is kind of led by promptings, and just recently I felt the need to serve males and females. I'm really excited, and I'm happy to be here. Oh, I love it. This is, I'm going to let all the parents in on a little secret right here. Okay, so I have, we all have tools that we want our kids to learn, right? And sometimes they don't want to talk about them with us or they're at least as coaches, my kids are like, oh, mom, don't try to coach me or whatever. I don't need to be taught those things or, but I feel like for my kids, like saying, hey, listen, I've got this fantastic person I think you could work with to help you in your sport of interest or whatever. It's like this sneaky little undercover way to continue to teach your kids things that are going to be life skills forever. So there's my tip to all parents today. If you have athletes, this is like, this is a great, a great way to teach them some life skills (laughs) working with Lorraine. (laughs) It's so true because even I think for athletes, the name mental performance coach just sounds better. Like, you know, we're all life coaches and we teach these tools, but these same principles apply to them in their sport. And it just helps them overcome this anxiety and create that confidence, um, which my favorite part is, is on and off the court or whatever sport it is on the field or off the field in the pool mm-hmm. or out of it. But yeah, like you said, it's, it can feel like that because Sometimes a life coach can be connected with, oh, there's something wrong with me or something with therapists, which is completely, you know, it's just some cultural things um, that's been created. But mental performance coach sounds like another specific sports conditioning training, but for the mind, which is exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. And it transfers to every avenue in our lives, right? The things that we learn there helps us. It's even better. Yes. (laughs) Yes. It helps us in a sport. It helps in families. It helps in relationships. It helps in school. It helps in all the things. So anyway, I just, I, I feel like this is a great avenue for working with teens and, and young adults. Yes. I love, I mean, I have four of my own and well, I guess I still call them teens, but two of them are out of the teenage years. Um, But yeah, I feel like I've been living this for so many years and I've had so many different um, church callings working with the youth that I just felt really led that this is where I need to be to help them. 
And I've noticed these days, especially we just moved from Washington State to Utah, St. George, but it was very apparent maybe in the surface back in Washington that the teenagers are suffering. They're like suffering from this post-COVID mental health area and they're trying to figure themselves out. And I'm sure that's happening here in Utah too. I just just moved recently, so I haven't really seen it as much, but it just kind of solidified to me more so that it's needed and I'm in the right place for me right now to help them the best that I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so fantastic. Okay. Before we go on, we don't get a whole lot of accents here on (laughs) this, on this podcast. And I know people are going to want to know. So you said you moved from Washington to Utah, but that does not tell us where yeah. your accent comes from. So tell me, tell me where. That's funny because I forget that whenever I'm in a new place, I feel like I just need to introduce that part first because I'm like, are people listening to me or are they just figuring out where I'm <laughs> where I'm from? And I like <laughs> I to ask people because I always get like five other places. Usually where I'm actually from is like the third or fourth guess, you know, but it's New Zealand, not Australia or Africa mm-hmm. or Boston. Those <laughs> Those are some of the ones that people <laughs> think. But New Zealand is where I'm born and raised as a Kiwi. Okay. Oh, I love it. What an amazing place to call home. Do you get back there very often? Um, we try to. So I met my husband at BYU Hawaii and he's from California. That's how I ended up in the States. But the first rule was I need to go home at least every two years. And we did do that for a while, but then we had more kids and life just got busy. And yeah. most of my family ended up moving to the States. And so that was what was most important. I wanted my kids to see their culture back home. So they got enough of that, but we tried to, we almost went this Christmas, but it didn't work out, but we'll yeah. get there again. <laughs> well, that's a total sidetrack, but I, yeah. I we just, like I said, it, we had to just get that, clear that up. So no one is trying to guess. Everybody's <laughs> listening to what you have to say and said, like I said, but all right. So as we get started here, I know that all of us have mind blocks that prevent us from doing and being the people that we want to be. I would imagine though, as you work with your athletes, that there are particular mind blocks that you see come up. And I'm curious about that a little bit. What do you see coming up for them and what creates the problems? Okay. So the first one that comes to my mind is perfection is that they're constantly kind of scrutinized or graded for their stats and so that just becomes like this natural thing right like what's the numbers like how am I compared to everyone else like how can I become like perfect it's this expert unrealistic expectation that they I don't even real know if they realize that they've created and so when they're not meeting that standard of perfection that they've created for themselves they feel less than they feel like they've failed and so they come into sessions with me already feeling like um, they're not worthy and they're just not good enough because their value and their worth is all um, associated with who they are as an athlete and an athlete needs to be perfect it's just that's something that they create you know a lot of them create mm-hmm. and it's become very common and so I think we we sit down and, and I just remind them that they're not isolated in who they are in their situation because I a lot of them feel like it's just them going through this and um I remind them that perfection doesn't even exist. So that's the first kind of barrier and, 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 you know, refer to a lot of like famous athletes out there, like who do they admire and remind them that none of them are perfect and they've all made errors and most sports events, they continue and they go further because of errors, you know, Mm -hmm. that if there are no errors, then there'd be no points and there'd be no game. (laughs) And so, yes, Yeah. And so I think just for them to remember like, oh, wait, it's okay to make uh, mistakes. It doesn't mean, you know, whatever they're making it mean, we figure that out together. What are you making it mean um, about who they are as a person? And it doesn't um, create their whole identity from the results of their games, from errors or inconsistencies. And so I think it's just breaking down that whole belief that there are perfect athletes out there and that's what they need to be. And if they're not, then they've failed. Mm -hmm. Perfectionism is such an interesting and rampant, I think, thing in our society. In fact, I was working, I have a 
a cute young client right now. She's only 11. And one of the things that she says that she, you know, that her brain tries to tell her is that she's, she's a perfectionist, that she's got to be perfect at the things that she does. And so it's not, I mean, it starts young. It's that belief is not just, it's not just in athletes. It's in so many parts of our society in every age of our society. And it's really can be very debilitating. Yeah. It affects their performance. You know, everything like Mm -hmm. we know as coaches, it all stems from the beliefs and thoughts that they've created. And so when they're thinking and they're striving to be perfect and not realizing that it's, it doesn't exist, then they're always going to be let down and they're always going to feel like they're not good enough and walk off, you know, their court um, feeling like, I'm just not a good enough athlete. Like, yeah. why am I here? And, you know, once we start to kind of feel like these negative emotions, it's so easy to bring all this other evidence and like, this is why I'm not good. It's because I did this or my coach doesn't like me. My teammates think that I've failed them. Whatever it is, it just comes so easy to them to find all these reasons why they're not good enough. Yeah. And the interesting thing about perfection and perfectionism is that we think it's kind of a noble thing. Like, striving for perfection is so good. And really it's driven by fear. It's a total fear-based thing that we have. Like it's part of people pleasing. It's, it's really interesting to think about it because we think it's such a, a good thing to strive for. And it really is, it keeps us stuck and it keeps us from progressing. Yeah. And it's beautiful when that moment happens and they start to realize that. And it's almost like they're giving themselves some grace, like, Oh, it's okay. Like, I'm still like amazing. Like I can still be great without being perfect, which has never been, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's just breaking down those walls. One of my favorite parts of coaching is when I see it in their eyes, like you can say things, you can say words and people could just stare at you. But when you see that moment where they start to believe it and they're like, wait, I'm, I could be doing okay right now. And I can still succeed and I can even, you know, be greater with this belief that I'm not perfect, you know, like it's possible that I can be this imperfect person slash athlete and become a stronger athlete Mm -hmm. and person. I always like to put them and, and not just athlete because the focus is when you're an athlete and something happens like an injury, then it feels like the whole world has imploded and I've experienced that myself and that's another reason why I want to coach athletes because I didn't realize for years that I had put my own um, worth on this category of I'm an athlete until I had a major injury and I was like devastated and depressed for a year at least and I hid it from everyone this is before I had all these coaching tools and I thought Mm -hmm. I could figure it out myself Um, and so I I understand I, I feel for them and I and I know that it, when we put our all our worth into this title of athlete um, that that's not going to serve us best and so when I coach I coach on the whole you know you're you're an athlete but you're also more than an athlete like congratulations it's great that let's celebrate your skills for this area of your life but let's also celebrate what other skills you have and your worth as a whole yeah I I actually think a lot about roles and the roles that we have and the labels we put on ourselves. And I agree with you so much. Like it's so easy for us to grab onto a label, grab onto a role and identify with it. And then when something goes wrong, it's like this identity crisis that happens. Yeah. And it's so important. I love that you say you refer to them as an individual and an app or however you said that, because it is very important because that is like going to be for most of our kids and most of the athletes, that role or that label is going to be very short lived in their long perspective of life. But the other things that we have, the other roles that we play, um, you know, daughter, mother, you know, child of God, those things are eternal. And if we can grasp onto those and put a little bit more weight in those than the, than the title of an athlete, I think the identity crisis doesn't happen quite so easily. And things yeah, this balance. And it's like a beautiful thing to be more than an athlete. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm curious what your sport was like, like as an athlete, when you, you said you had an injury, tell me what, what happened. So it was cross country, which is funny because when I was in high school, I actually hated long distance running. And I, I will say that I wrote a note that my parents didn't write it saying, you know, just trying to get me out of it just so I could just sit and watch everyone. Cause that was like my worst. But then I went to BYU Hawaii and I was like, I want to, how can I keep fit? And I, you know, I love track and, but they had a cross country team. So I heard about it basically the night before and I tried out with, I'm a twin with my twin sister, like, Hey, let's just do it. And so anyway, we made it. And, and so we ran cross country for BYU Hawaii and I loved it. I ended up loving it something that I hated. And, and I love sharing that too, because, you know, that's life, right? We, how do we know unless we really try and we get consistent and then we can decide. So it was something that I ended up having a passion for. And I just continued after I graduated because you could do that anywhere. It's easy. Just go for a run. And, um, but then I got my degree in exercise sports science and I was a personal trainer for years because it would fit perfectly with being a mother. I thought, cause I can figure out my own schedule Um, But I got really consumed in athlete life and I only wanted to train people. um, Not that I would say it out loud, but I, my favorite was training athletes and people who were just already really fit and I could do all the fun, you know, plyometrics and all the, all the cool, you know, quote unquote things um, that look good. Um, And then the day happened where I would train that way too. My, my motto in my mind was like, just always be beast mode, you know, in the gym and be better than anyone who looks super athletic. So I would be, if someone was on a treadmill, even like three treadmills down from me and their speed was faster, I would be watching them and I would do faster than what their speed was. I was competing with everyone. Yeah. And and if someone was doing pull-ups, I was like, well, I'm going to learn, I'm going to get stronger and do the same amount of pull-ups or even more if I can, like a female, I would always kind of And I didn't realize that this was very unhealthy. It was just like who I became and who I was once again, before I learned all the mindset tools. And there was one day when I was like, okay, I'm just going to do these plyometrics and, and, you know, jump box jumps and I injured myself. And this was also the morning that I started taking a pre-workout and I was like, well, maybe I'll just do, you know, almost double the amount and I didn't have anything to eat. I broke off like a thumb sized piece of bread early in the morning. And I was like, that's enough to kind of balance it out of my system. And so I was on this buzz and doing all the things and I landed, I knew the moment when I landed and I could feel like a crunch in my back, but I was still on such an adrenaline high that I was like, oh, it should be okay. I remember I could barely walk to the truck to drive home. And by the time I got home, I was like, I can't even get out of my car, but I kind of had to sit there for a while and try to kind of walk out and hold on to the side. My husband had gone to work already. My kids were getting ready to go to school and I called them to say a prayer before they went to school, but I couldn't stand. So I was lying on the floor and all of a sudden I was like, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to make it, but my kids were looking at me. So I had to put on this face, like, I'm okay. My brother-in-law lived next door at the time and he came and called my husband and they had to carry me into the truck. And then we didn't make it like we were going to go to the hospital because I felt like I got freezing all of a sudden. And I felt like if I closed my eyes, they, I wouldn't be able to open them. And I remember seeing my daughter look at me and looking so scared. And I was like, just don't close your eyes. You're like, just stay, you know, awake. And we had to go to the closest fire station and I had an ER uh, ambulance take us. And basically I do not take pre-workout anymore. So this is like, also I like, don't take it if if it's not I don't think it's necessary anyway but that's that was kind of that pivotal moment where I you know later on found I had herniated discs because I had you know put too much compression on them and it was an awakening and I feel like Heavenly Father was like I know that this is the only way that it will get through to you because you're stubborn and you just you know you're going to continue in this and you're not going to learn what I want you to learn to become who I want you to become. And so I went through a year of depression and I didn't tell anyone because I didn't know how to deal with it. I had no tools. I had no idea. I was like, just read my scriptures, say my prayers, like what else is on the primary list? You know, Um, I remember I would just come out to my husband and he didn't know how to deal with it. He would just think, oh, just be happy. Like that's all he knew too. Like, can't you just be happy? And I know now looking back, 
Um, my final option was after I'd read my scriptures, you know, done all those things was I remember listening to a general conference talks and it was talking about mental health and it was almost like it gave me permission, like you are seen and your value as um, who you are. It's okay to, t- you know, see someone and to see a therapist because just because you can't see it visually, it doesn't mean that it's not, it's not important, you know, like yeah. it's, does that make sense? And I always yeah. forget who the speaker is, but someone usually tells you it was this person. So that was on my list to find out. But that was a pivotal moment where I was like, I need to go find someone else. And I went and seeked out a therapist. And that first session, no, first three sessions, I just like basically cried the whole hour that mm-hmm. I had because I'd never learned to process my emotions and I didn't know what to do with what was coming up for me inside. Um, and that was my changing moment, my transformation, where I was like, how can I help people who have been through this? How can I be that mental performance coach, like that life coach and that person that will be there and help them understand and have them feel like I'm not alone and feel safe to share whatever's coming up without feeling judged because I didn't feel so comfortable talking to family about it because I felt like I was just going to be judged. And I know I was creating a lot of this, but I felt safe talking to some stranger who had been trained in it and who wasn't all just like consoling me, who was just giving me that neutral space to cry as much as I wanted without like looking at me like, what's wrong with you? Like, are you kind of crazy? You know, because I was starting to feel like what was wrong with me? Like, why am I going through this? And so this was my super long answer to your simple question, (laughs) but that's where my kind of transformation led from that experience was which I fully believe God placed that for me because he knew that that may have been the only way that I could figure things out because I'm a stubborn person and now I my relationship with my children is different I see things different I I want to help people who have gone through hardships I no longer want oh I just want the athletes who look like they've got it all together I want the people who have hard times and don't know and so who's struggling and don't know how who have had injuries or experiences that they feel so lost but they can't figure out what's next because I I get it and I just have a passion and love for them to help them love themselves thank you so much for sharing that story (laughs) and I think there's so much to learn from that I have been through similar experiences the thing that I think that is that I really want to pull out from that. And when, and this will probably be a total sidetrack that where you would want to go, but you made, you said something like, you know, I was doing all the primary things. I was reading my scriptures. I say my prayers. And I think that is something it's so important for us to address that sometimes we think that if we do more of that, then um, it will fix our problems. Yeah. And, and so when it doesn't happen, when we keep doing all those things and our problems the depression or whatever yeah. it is that we're struggling with doesn't go away. We think that we are, there's something wrong with us that we still could be doing more. We must not be righteous enough. We must not be faithful enough. And I think that's a really slippery slope and something that we have to be really careful um, yeah. to recognize. So I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, I think in our culture, we have a tendency to think, well, if I just do all more of all these things, it will yeah, help. Yeah. But, but the truth is, is we have to do all that we can do and all that we can do involves seeking help and yeah. not just reading our scriptures and, and saying our prayers and going to the temple, but seeking help from people that are trained and experienced in helping as well. Yeah. And it's beautiful because then it helps us even as life coaches, like this can, it feels like a calling sometimes, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. For me, it does. And it helps me to feel like there's real purpose because I've experienced it myself. And, and sometimes it is outside of it's going outside of what those primary answers are. And that's Mm -hmm. what God wants us to do to continue to take action. You know, he's given us resources, but there are other resources that may not be in our little bubble you know of what we learned growing up it might yes. be reaching out and being vulnerable to find someone else and yeah. that's all part of the connection of us being yeah. connected as people yeah so true so you get, just gave us a great example of you and and what led you here I'm curious can you give us an example of an athlete that you have worked with and kind of the transformation or 
how you worked with them and the before and after? Yeah, I can think of one. Um, she came in thinking she needed to be perfect in her schoolwork and and as an athlete. And she just came in like, this is it. This is like, this is my program. This is what I need to do. It was just kind of like she came in, you know, a, all the bullet points of what she needs to succeed. And it's, it's just kind of fun because I love to listen and like, okay, you know, let's just take in this and then share tools that she hasn't used and kind of break up these beliefs that she felt like she had to be perfect. And, and it was just amazing watching her transformation when she started to consider that there could be other ways to succeed than striving to fit in this perfect little box and then have her practice. I love um, one thing that with athletes is it seems like they, they pick up on things really fast because I think they're using these skills and talents that they already have as being an athlete and they learn new skills really fast because they've practiced and they know what it takes to be really good at what they do. And so they're using those same skills, but transferring it over to mindset. And they're like, okay, I'm willing to do this. If this can help me, you know, better be a better athlete, which it starts off. That's their, you know, mm -hmm. their purpose, like to be a better athlete. Yes. And, and that is enough to drive them to try these things. Like, Hey, let's, let's consider these thoughts that you're having. Is it working for you? Is it serving you? Like, if not, like we can stay there or we can try something new and then they get to lead, you know, and their own process and practice it and and use those repetitions and see that wait this this whole mindset stuff can actually work like this is actually helping me become stronger because I feel more confident I'm no longer doubting myself when this is with a volleyball player you know when she's returning or when she makes an error there used to be this place where like oh I'm just not as good oh what's happened to me you know just it kind of coming with all these others what are they thinking what's my coach thinking is he going to take me off am I, are my teammates not going to pass it to me because I'm not as good and and it goes from those previous thoughts to her being like, yeah, I'm really good. Or if, if I made an error, you know, next one would, is the common one that they create, like their quick thought to make them, you know, in the moment with a fast paced thought. So it'd be, oh, next one. And then it's just like, they're no more longer dwelling on the mistake, but they're dwelling on what's next. And it's, it's just very simple pivots that helped her to become really confident and for her coaches to notice other parents and her mom was sending me messages from tournaments like she's amazing she's doing so great she's just so confident she's so happy and those are those moments for me it's not like oh I did this it's like they see now that they have been capable this whole time because nothing has shifted with their training. It's just their mind and belief in themselves that has shifted and their confidence that's increased. So from um, this, I had a six week container with her from the beginning to the end. She was a different person. She would come just fully relaxed in her sessions from this initial, like very tense, like I just have to do everything perfect. And that's the only way I can succeed to, wow, I'm really doing good in my classes and my um, volleyball games because I now see that I'm like imperfectly perfect in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Not that she said that, but it's just like, I'm doing great because I believe in myself as opposed to I'm only good if I match all these bullet points and check them off mm -hmm. for the for the day. Mm -hmm. Yes. So important. And once again, so transferable to Life. so many different things in our lives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have really enjoyed this conversation before we head off today. Is there anything that you haven't, that we haven't talked about that you feel like we need to share? Right now, I just think of all of us as coaches that are listening and like we all have these different callings to where we're supposed to serve and who we're gathering. Our purpose is to bring more peace and confidence and have people just know their deep value without all the surface stuff. And, and I'm just, I guess I just want to say I'm really grateful to be a part of this group, of this gathering I feel like we're all gathering together in Zion these last days and we're doing our part to bring people to know that they're all so important to remind them that they are loved and ultimately I think because it comes from God like all of this is from him like I am so grateful for 
the way that he leads me in my life. I just want to end with gratitude for what we all do and for where we are in life at this time. And just I'm grateful to be a part of this LDS community also and and be surrounded by like-minded people who have the same purpose to help other people. Yeah. Thank you so much. I feel so much the same way. It's, it's like, we're just bringing people to light, to happiness and to more peace. And, and that's all done from having some different perspectives and just some shifts. And I feel the same way. So blessed to be part of such a great community surrounded by amazing coaches who really have the same goals. And that is just to bring more light and give more light in the world. So thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being a part of it. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. It's so needed and such a great avenue of getting that light into the yeah. world. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. I loved it. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks for all of you who are listening today. If you have athletes, if you know athletes, share this podcast episode with them and Lorraine, can you share with us where people can find more of you? Okay, so on Instagram, probably the most. So just at Lorraine.Hedrick. And then I have my website, Lorraine Hedrick, and a Facebook group. And that's the girl, I need to change the name because it's the girl mentoring, which I can't even remember exactly what it's called. (laughs) But you'll have it linked. (laughs) Yeah. Because I've been thinking I need to change it because I've just switched to males and females, but I have a Facebook group too, and you can see the link. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. So if you have athletes, you know, people with athletes, send them these resources because it is a fantastic, um, it's just just a fantastic avenue into, to finding more light in their lives. So thank you for being here and we'll see you all again next week. Thanks, Lorraine. Thanks, Heather. Hey, we just wanted to thank you for spending part of your day here with us at Latter-day Life Coaches and being part of this conversation. Share this with your friends so that you can have a conversation with them on this topic as well. And as always, subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Have a good one, my friends.